How y'all doing? Hello, I'm your host, Jackie Clay. Welcome to a very special episode of Monograph. Tonight, we pay tribute to one of Alabama's most prolific vernacular artists, Thornton Dow. Through archival footage of the late artist, interviews with his children, and a talk with fellow artist and friend, Lonnie Holly, we will learn all about his life, his vision, and his legacy. Here we are talking about one of the greatest artists that probably ever lived, and his name was Thornton Dow. I've been making stuff all my life. What was it like watching him make the work? Just to watch him work? Oh, it was amazing. Because he would work on like three and four pitches at a time. Did you always think of your father as an artist? It wasn't a more creative person than he on the planet than him, you know, because he always had to be doing something, you know. So even when you cut the lights off in the house, I think he was still in there trying to do something, you know. Daddy would paint all night. Daddy, when you wake up in the morning, daddy would be out there painting. Because that was, to daddy, it was uh, or something to relax him. It, when he was be out there working and doing it by itself, it relaxes his mind. So if it, if his mind tell him to, to work on art today, that's what he was gonna do. Uh, he was gonna work on art. When I get something on my mind, that's what I do. And you can see it in my works because that's what I do. And then you can be able to see me, you can be able to see what I'm talking about by looking at what I do. Just about the hardest time of my life of growing up. We we come up pretty hard. It was a pretty hard life for us. We didn't have any fathers to take care of you. Most of his work is going to involve women. His great grandmom raised him until he got about six years old. His grandmama raised him until he got. 12 years old, and his great aunt raised him until he got grown. So those are the main uh, figures in his life, you know. Do you think that showed up in his parenting also, you know? I'm sure it, it did, because, you know, he didn't have a father, and he really wanted to be a great father for his kids, and he was. And I think him just looking back at his life, and that was a goal of his, do everything in his power for his family. The siblings are so close, you know. Yes. We get along real good. No problem. Do you feel like that was cultivated by your parents, you know? Yes. And like yes. what was that dynamic like growing up in? Growing up in, you know, with your siblings and stuff. Oh, it was wonderful. We didn't we know not to argue or anything like that cuz mom and dad didn't play that. One of the worst whoopings you probably would get for for not respecting each other. So I mean, they made sure that happened. So um, that made you a better person. And uh, I probably wouldn't argue with now one of my brothers and sisters, even to this day. You know, I wouldn't have a bad word to say to one of them. So but try to get along with them. So that came from them raising me up, you know. And I taken care of Clara and my children the best I know and kept them together the best I know. So they give me credit for it today. They said, Daddy said you about the best I know. So I feel good at that, you know. Did he tell jokes or was he a storyteller or like what was his um He could tell jokes. Humor? And uh, just 
tell a joke on his own self and make you laugh. And uh, he was just fun to be around. Now he could talk. If they let him talk for hours, he would talk for hours on it. Tell him about his pictures and what they meant to him. And yeah, he really enjoyed talking about that. See, you're looking at the war when you're looking at the peace. You're looking at the, everything that God created in the war, which never go away in the war. See, that's the way life is. What God put in the world, he put in there for us to survive. All this is surviving. Because Mr. Dow was doing some really, really serious, heavy stuff about us and our living order, our just off of the plantation, or just out of slavery attitude, our marching uh, for our rights, our civil rights movements, and all of these other kind of things. Everybody don't understand history. See? But I just want to show you history. This is what it's all about. Asking questions and trying to find out things and trying to figure out how things work. We're trying to find that out because that's something we ain't never been into. After trying to bring on freedom after Martin Luther King did all these freedom of march and things and things that happened. And it's still happening, you know? They're still getting killed and beaten up and stuff. So we want to ask a lot of questions about that. We have a struggle in life, and uh, our pains and things carry us a long ways in life, as far as we can go. In some of the conversations that's come up that your dad even before he was like making art to sell or, you know, that he was doing some things like he had a very particular fence that he made, mm -hmm. the driveway. He also was making fish with marbles. Like, can you remember some of that like real early work where he was doing it really, it seems like for himself and for his like. When the plant closed down, all of dad and, and, and uh, my two brothers, all of us working at Pullman building, building box cars. And when uh, it closed down, it, it pretty much put all of us out of a job. And Daddy started taking cans, beer cans, cut the top out of them, fill them up with cement, with concrete, and then he'll put a piece of aluminum pipe down in it. And he'll cut out a bird or either fish or something and tie it on to that. And I'm like, God, dog, daddy, daddy needs to find something to do. Now, he's losing it now. But again, still, I got works over here for you. I got work in the plant. I got work in your car places. I got work anywhere I work at. That was one of the ways, one of the reasons why he was discovered in the first place because of the things that he had made, that he had spread it through the community and Lonnie Harder, for some reason, uh, picked up a couple of pieces and carried back to his house. And I sought him out because I'm, I'm saying this guy is an artist in my brain uh, and I would like to see what he's doing. So what was interesting talking to the kids, his children, uh, who are adults, <laughs> uh, they talked a lot about the way their home was growing up and like how he, ev everything was something he was like making with his hands. It was deeply creative. Like when you first met and you first visited him, what was, what did you see? Well, when I first met Thorntendahl and visiting him, and seeing his working habit, uh, it's almost like you're still seeing him working for Pullman and working on the clock. He was a he was a prolific worker. I mean, he worked it on large scales with Pullman. Mm -hmm. 
And he grew into that with his art that actually got a chance to be exhibited all around the world. I thought Lonnie Harley was a great man because Lonnie Harley could explain just about anything. And now this, I looked at him and then, and he made me feel good by told me, he said, man, said, you know what? I said, what that? He said, you this is art, man. I said, this is what art? This is art. I said, I said, yeah. He said, can you make stuff? I said, yeah, I can make anything, Lonnie. He said, Lonnie, uh, Lonnie said, well, I'm gonna, I tell you what, I'm gonna bring you somebody to help you. And he went and got Mr. Arnett. came out there and he was just knocked off his feet because he was looking at the stuff that Daddy had made and he uh, offered Dad a certain amount for it. Well, he asked Daddy what would he take for it? And Daddy said, uh, oh, $25. He said, no, nah, Mr. Dial, I don't want to take it from you. Well, give me 35 <laughs> He said, no, nah, Mr. Dial. He said, uh, I want to buy it. I don't want to take it from you. He said, well, uh, I don't know, well, it was $200 or $250 be okay for it. Dad said, oh, yeah, man, yeah. Now he got somebody that would buy it from him. Even before the Arnett's, some of your siblings expressed that folks in the neighborhood were, while they don't maybe understand the scope of what he did, like they haven't seen all of his work or, you know, that there was, there was a, an appreciation for his his creative energy in the uh, neighborhood and stuff? You know, some of the little stands and stuff Daddy made and painted them a certain way. Uh, you know, he would probably give them to people. Uh, maybe some, maybe some, they'd, you know, give them a little something for it. But it, that was odd. I mean, but who, they don't know is no odd. The word art meant Picasso, and if you weren't a Picasso, then you weren't an artist. So, being an artist was something in the black community that was just almost non-existent. What is an artist? You know, it's someone that creates. So if you look at art that way, then he been an artist all his life because that's all he did was try to create. As far as daddy uh, growing up saying that he was an artist, you know, like I said, that didn't exist in the black community. And the means of materials that Mr. Dow used for me, I, I was just, I, I was fascinated uh, to see that he would use the, and I think I spoke to you about uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Uh, do we say trash too quickly? Mr. Dow saw it as material. I think when Mr. Dow first showed me what he was working with, and I said, wow, you made that out of this material? I didn't say you made that out of this trash. And he wasn't afraid to kind of take something and bend it into shape and show you ideologically what his intentions were and how these intentions played together. But the whole thing with putting these pieces together, that was so beautiful, so beautiful, with so much information. When art hit you, you've been hit, baby. And when that piece of art, especially if it's powerful enough to grab your attention and say, damn, I never seen anything like this before.
the way I see life like that, it is a beautiful life. It likes to do it with tin cans or doing with anything or, or oil cans that I you made and made bricks and stuff out of it. I want to show that picture. In his early work, you know, he you can if you look at that, then you can see where he incorporated, you know, all of the materials and stuff that he was normally working with into his art. And from that point, you know, uh, you could kind of see the progress that he made over the years. These, these, these things just out of a rag that he would flip and turn or taking uh, pieces of rugs or whatever, tan them, tan them to pieces. It was just, you say, wow, is this going to be a, a ongoing thing? And it was an ongoing thing, uh, piece after piece after piece. And each piece became greater. And that was totally, that was enough to, not only for Bill to say, this is greatness. This is our, our as one would say, this is genius. The time come in your life where all the star stars line up right, and that's the perfect moment, and it's not going to exist another time in your life. Is when everything you ever did in your life come together because all the things that you did in your life makes up who you are. I think that's the moment in his life when things came together. And you can, he probably would say, you can call it what you want to, but, you know, now is the opportunity which I can provide for my family. And uh, it's something that I enjoy doing and it's something that I've been looking for my whole life. And the stars lined up right. Now, you know, he's, his artwork is being shown, you know, all over the world. So it's an amazing thing, you know. I used to say many times that when I get grown, I'm gonna get this. <laughs> and I got it too, but don't you think I didn't? Do you remember when those works were like in his studio space? Yeah. And mm -hmm. like he was working on it. What is it like, like watching that process? Well, you don't think it's gonna look as good when it get to its final destination and when it get to to where they're gonna hang it and put it on the wall and put the lights on it, it don't look like he made. What's that mean? You know, it looked like it it, it just come alive. And uh, I don't know, it just looked like it's something special when they put the lights on it. It's time to be celebrated. And if if Alabama is going to say, we want to celebrate it, then let's do it. It was a baby when it left, and then it's now being brought back. It, it had gotten time to grow, and it needed that time. I, I don't want to think about it being something that is at a late moment. But I remember this song that the G's band quilters would sing. Give us our flowers while we yet live. And that's something that's heavily needed. Is we need a lot of 
celebration. And, and, and we need a lot of celebration. We need the Dow's family to return and say we want to do what our our fathers our fathers again did. And they love me like I am affiliated as a part of the family. And I want to show them how much I appreciate that. For its, you know, name recognition associating it with the word art. Uh, there's a lot of people in this community would like to be able to do that, you know, just to associate themselves with it art. They know him. I mean, like I say, from teenagers up until, you know, probably 90 years old, if they're still living, a lot of people in the area really know him and, um, you know, heard a lot of great things about his artwork. But 99% of them, 99.5, uh, 6, 7, 8% of them wouldn't know a piece of his art if, if you put it in front of them. And so that's the reason, you know, this interview uh, means so much to me and the family. And uh, I just can't wait for to see that day come. And um, I think it's something that uh, the community been waiting on for a long time. Because you're talking about maybe 30 years, you know. Daddy was, he was, was respected in the, in the neighborhood with, People his age and people my age and people a little bit younger, they knew him. And, uh, you know, I, 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 a lot of them guys, I would like to let them know that he was having a show right here at home. So that would be fantastic. I'm going to say 70, 80% of his life was dedicated to trying to create different things, you know, which nobody paid attention to. And uh, that's one reason I think the family's kind of like in shock today because, and it, it to a degree is funny and then to a degree it hurts because uh, we're reaping like the benefit of what he did in his life. But you also, you know, it's a period in there that you could have supported and you didn't. It's a good thing and sometimes you look at it, it's almost like being stabbed in the heart because like something should have told me you'd just be there anyway. If you had to use just a few words to describe your dad, how would you describe him? He was an amazing person, wonderful. And he didn't, he didn't hate no one. He loved it, everybody he met. And that was my dad. But, uh, I think I, uh, he was more of a, uh, a man and a family man. And than he were, you know, an artist. So that's about as high a scale as I could put him on. Just looking back, that I, I wouldn't want to be raised up with nobody except for him and, and uh, my mom, Clara. He was such a wonderful person. He always did everything. I took the time to smile with you. He took the time to come and say with you. And this almost always brings me to tears. We was always hugging each other. He was almost like a father to me, also like a big brother to me, also like a friend to me. Being my dad, he was my best friend, so. Uh... If you, what are some like, what is like if you had to choose one word to describe your father? 
what would that word be? He was perfect. Yeah. I wouldn't trade him for nobody else, Dad. You know, I just want him. Yeah. Yeah, he was perfect. Like I said, I'm really uh, proud of this moment because you all are here to document this time and this story. Uh, I think what they call it a true Alabama success story. Yeah. Now y'all go, man. I'm sick of y'all. <laughs>